just going to share some insights in Silodeca's mind uh, and way of working and writing uh, in relation to the show, which was inspired by uh, Silodeca's book, Quite, Quite by Lots of Dreams. So, thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm researching on Silo Deca's work, uh, both his novel, two novels, that is the, the, I mean, the, I mean, the, I mean, the first one, um, 13 Cents, and The Quiet Violence of Dreams. Um, I think if you look at this art, uh, I think the important thing that comes through in Silo Deca's work, I think it's trauma. The trauma, I mean, the background, the trauma. Uh, but most importantly, I think what runs through Silo Deca's work is the question of alienation. This individual who are come, I mean, who's coming out into this new transformed dispensation where you know you don't fit into social conventions in so many ways. I mean he's a young black person coming out most of most of the time I and mean, he's in Cape Town. He moves into the social world where he's unsettled. He feels alienated in so many ways, sexuality, most of the time, most of the protagonists, like Silo, as we saw in, in, in the Quiet Valley of Dreams, he doesn't have parents, he's all by himself, he's facing the world, there's nobody. And, but, but most importantly, as a black person, he has these identities that uh, people do not associate with blackness, at least at that time, as the books were published, you know, being gay, being single, but most importantly, a male sex worker, you know, a you know, uh, steam window singer in Cape Town. So he has all these multiple empires. But most importantly, he's someone who's not anchored in any community moves. I mean, in mean, that text, he's originally from, from Joburg. He goes into Cape Town, into a very alienating environment, not only just uh, in terms of um, other racial groups, but even the black spaces or the alleged black spaces in that city. They also feel alienated to him as well. But perhaps maybe rather than me making a lecture, I think I would prefer for us to have a conversation. You could speak a little bit to the works that are up. Oh, the works that are up. Um, I think starting here, I mean, um, for example, I mean, starting with the painting here, this lone figure, I think for me, it connects to that question of alienation. You know, this low, I mean, low figure, as you can see, is this, I mean, you know, sort of like um, the painting projects the alienation of this individual, you know, sort of like against this background, you know, seamless environment that sort of like he stands out against this, uh, I mean, this, uh, I mean, this environment. And also, most importantly, the question of running. I mean, it seems to be, I mean, you know, to be running away from something. Which is something that I think in Deca's works, uh, I mean the two of them, but most importantly in the quite violence of the times, there's always this question of, of trauma, you know, um, when, I mean in, in, in quite violence of the times, Tepo is raped, and it, it's, it's a sort of like a collective kind of, of rape, you know, where, you know, it's sort of like being put into mind, you know, uh, I mean, assaulted and rape effect, it's a, I mean, it's a combination. So, this trauma, but ultimately running away, running away from danger, but also can also look at it uh, as, uh, you know, running to find salvation, you know, which, which sort of like in this text, in both Deca's texts, remain elusive. So I think quite violent from dreams and, 
in a sense, is a kind of lays some ground for most people in like accessing what is post-apartheid. I think, I, for me personally, it wasn't a thing to think about post-apartheid South Africa until I actually read it. And I was very young when I read the book, so I was not even like um, able to understand most of the angst that he was dealing with in that in that time. Um, so the way that this exhibition kind of taps into um, the artists working and, and the text is that it's a context that most of us actually understand and can relate to and actually also it comes through in how we work and how others have worked but it was, it's never been like an overt link. So the most important thing is that um, Moshe Kualanga, Robin Road, um, Stacey Hardy, a whole lot of artists actually at the time were having this similar kind of uh, experiences and were actually speaking and talking about it with Silodeka. So there is um, in one way kind of, uh, not necessarily a memory, but just like making that connection and also realizing that even though that was like, a, well it feels like a long time ago now when the book was written, it still has so many like, um, it still resonates on so many levels. Like for me, Cape Town does not feel any different to what he described in the book. It's still really, really almost the same. Um, so it's it's really was just like picking up on the threads that are in the book, and then easily actually you could in this exhibition you could almost include any South African artist mm -hmm. because those are just like it's it's context which is just by living in, 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 in South Africa, just by being gay in South Africa, or, you know, um, trauma, you know, Bukhosi um, Kukune and Angel Ho's performance is um, CBD, at the battle of the CBD demons, and it's just trauma. That's essentially um, what one does with just by uh, moving around the city, or being socially, or institutionally, And also, I mean, perhaps maybe from a, uh, I mean, from a literal point of view, not even just to connect here. I mean, Silo Deca, even in the book itself, it talks about painting. In fact, there is also, uh, I mean, the extra where it talks about the pre Raphael like, yeah. I mean, you know, and also I think in, even himself as a, as a student, I think in the he studied painting, yeah. and also he did some amateur paintings. I don't know to what extent have, been, have they been available to the public. So, in a way, I mean, beyond what the connection that you have, made yeah. but there's also that connection between uh, painting and writing even in Silo Deca's life and even in Silo Deca's words as well. So without asking and I guess maybe to be able to can speak to you most of the but I'm curious as to how you as a as a, a, a academic of literature respond when you see um, a show of artwork in Johannesburg um, because I know that uh, um, you had a couple last night about the, the differences in the kind of uh, the social fabric of Cape Town and Johannesburg and one of the works on show Cape Town um, uh, again live on uh, Neon work has a completely different residence in that city um, than it does in Johannesburg uh, maybe that's not entirely true so I'm curious what, what your what your response is to seeing a, a, an exhibition in Johannesburg based on a novel that um, is uh, certain character. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, I mean, in both Sinodeka's work, even though, you know, the, the, the larger certain character, but there's always this constant presence of Jobek. The protagonist, for example, are original from Jobek. Whatever that they observe about Cape Town, there's always this comparison between Jobek. So, in other words, Jobek is also a constant presence. Even though you know the setting is in Cape Town, but in, 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 in the in the narrator protagonist consciousness, Jobek is always a problem. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, a presence there. So, so for me, I don't see. I, I mean, I don't see that gap or that, or that dissonance. I mean, because even in the text, it's there. Because you have this. I mean, I mean, these two protagonists. Or in the case of uh, the quiet violence of dreams, Tech original comes from Cape Town, Jobek. I mean, circles in Cape Town, and whatever observations, I mean, they, I mean there's this friend of his, uh, Mawatu, that they call constantly talk about the difference between Cape Town and Joy. Yeah. This is Cape Town. And at one point, in fact, there's almost the tension where at one point they think Cape Town is better than Joy. At one point they think 
Jobek is better than Cape Town. So they are almost like in a nostalgia point. Monument, and that's immediately different. That's almost like a like a site-specific violence, and that you don't especially get in Joburg because in Joburg everything gets torn down and built up. Talk about this this morning. So maybe you can share some uh, in taking Tabo's suggestion of a conversation. Share some of your ideas of, of this kind of violence space. And making this work. Um, I think with Pretoria, I mean, you almost exactly touch on it. Um, you think of Pretoria when you go in. It's you know, especially when the jacarandas are out, it's purple, it's green, and you have these monuments, you know, um, Fort Tracker monuments, if you're coming in by a train greets you first, then you have Freedom Park, you have the Union buildings, and you almost don't see what's going on. So if someone comes to Pretoria, you're always like, okay, what's going on here? And everything is almost geographically hidden. And then you have the mountain, and then behind the mountain is where the wretched of the earth live. You know, and I think that is the violence of Pretoria. And, and when we had the protests now in Pretoria, I mean, a few weeks ago, if you were living on this side of the mountain, um, nothing happened. And then we had, we at the University of Pretoria, and there's this constant, oh, they are coming closer. You know, and then inside the stitch, there's this anxiety. But you don't, you don't really see the violence, but you know that it's there. And I, I would say, 
definitely in Pretoria that is the violence, that geographically everyone is hidden and so you have the city and I mean people talk about inner city Pretoria being a bit but it's definitely not as integrated or as it wasn't really taken over in the same way that Johannesburg was and, and in terms of in relation to Pretoria that would be the violence, that geographical separation by a physical mountain. <laughs> but just a comment. Uh, it's interesting. The last thing you said sounded like you were describing Cape Town. <laughs> like yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, the yeah. yeah. like there's so many similarities already. I think that you can um, pick up in the kind of nuances of how Victoria's landscape is and how I would say the only but Victoria is far more integrated than Cape Town is. Yeah. I'm I'm not a Cape Townian at all. And I went to Cape Town, I never been to Cape Town until very recently, maybe about four years ago now. And my first question was, where are the black people? Yeah. And of course the, the landscape looks very different in Cape Town, but you can immediately feel in Cape Town, well, something is very weird here. Yeah. And I don't feel like, yes, it feels very So Pretoria is, is far more integrated than Cape Town is. I mean, I lived in Cape Town before I lived in Johannesburg, and I read this book when I lived in Cape Town. And the trauma that is described in the book of the landscape was what I was actually experiencing at the time. It was very strange. Perhaps maybe a few months after I read it, I moved to Johannesburg because at that point it could not I could not see how I existed in Cape Town and did not what Gabba was saying about access and um, being able to feel like you are in a place, locate yourself in a place. Um, Cape Town did feel incredibly like uh, I guess uh, geographically, like uh, I don't know, violent. Like there's this terrible thing that's happening that you can't see, but you can see, and you can see really just the politeness of the city. Mm -hmm. What presents its, what presents itself in the face of politeness, mm -hmm. um, and that stuff is easy. And then you wonder why it's easy, you know? And that that weird kind of like slow creeping in trauma is what I felt in relation to the book in relation to and it's very different when you do it the other way around. Um, a lot of people who first lived in Johannesburg did an experience, so I think this is the experience of uh, the temple of the book. Mm -hmm. He has first lived in Johannesburg, and Johannesburg is taken with him as this kind of space of like nostalgia, but it's something yeah, that you can account for point. Yeah, um, and when, I guess I experience it differently and when you, when you are there in first, um, it's something that you don't know you're looking for, but you're looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of whatever. Yeah. So it's just a, a personal experience that kind of, I think, relates to the idea of trauma and space and, and moving. Um, so if, any, if you have a problem with anything, you can almost directly point to that. And that was my frustration with Cape Town, was people would have nice language of being offensive. That was my problem. But also the other thing is the it's easy to see the, the gang in Joburg. You know, like it's all here. Like it doesn't matter where you're driving, like you think you live in a suburb, there will be gang. You just drive past the gang. And it's part of the thing. You're not you never think that you're living in a dream. Like if you do that, really I don't know. You're living in Santa and you never leave. And I've met a few people and I also don't know Santa. So I know that you can have like this bubble thing that's happening, but if you're living, if you're working in the city, even if even if you're working like I think maybe until Rosebank, there's no way you're like protected from things that are happening, and you have a better, or maybe not better way, way of kind of um, putting them into little boxes. It's, it's like when there was the the student protest, you know, on TV, on Twitter, it looked bigger. It was um, kind of violent and all of these things. But we were sitting here like cheering and looking at the kids and it was, and that can happen here. In Joburg it can happen that people actually like easily see what they are doing. Like okay, so it's about this and this is the focus and this is not the focus. In Cape Town it's easily, ah, tourists, what are they going to do? They can't see protests. So there's, there's really like a, a that's why I'm saying it's failed and it's not at the same time. You don't, you know your problem, but like, I mean, there are obvious things. So there's also the crime thing. Everybody thinks Joe crime. Mm -hmm. Just 
like that's your constant question and constant having to like tell people. I mean, it's fun and it's not, I can't really promise you're not going to get money, but really I haven't got money. <laughs> so that's also the other thing that, that, that really is like a job of constant. It's like anyone from outside would be like, oh, I'm so scared, I can't, I can't go. And you also have to be kind of tough and to go out at night. Otherwise you're like crippled by fear. Dear things in a slightly different direction. We're talking about all these kind of traumatic ways of being in these different cities um, and I know that you've written quite a bit on how uh, Tiepo uh, or how I suppose Seladeka deals with his main protagonist, this kind of tragic comedic way of being if I remember correctly. Am I on the right track? Yeah, no I think maybe one point that, that I wanted to say, I mean in relation specifically to what has been said here, I think is, you know, the, 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 the whole concept of a city being divided into two, or having two parts, you know, to the city, the opulent part and the poverty stricken part, and I think it's something that, you know, uh, it, I mean, it's highlighted quite strongly in, in, in the quiet violence of trends. And the interesting thing is that, for example, you know, the, you know, the Cape Flats, which are the townships, the rest of the community that he visits. He can visit it on a social basis with friends, but the opulent part, he can only go there. He can only access it as a sex worker. In other words, he cannot go there on a social visit. You know, you have to have a reason to be there, you know, to cross that boundary. There must be a reason. You can't just, just go there on a social visit, like for example, as he was going to Kailicha or into, I mean, into Cape Flats, or I think there's one visit that uh, I mean, he undertakes to younger. But in the, in the opulent part, he can just go there, you know, on, 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 on a free spirited move to explore, I mean, to explore the city. You have this image that this is a guarded part of town, that you can't just walk in. And the, the way that he deals with it is kind of like uh, um, deeply tragic and also something comedic about the way that he kind of moves through his different adventures because he, you know, he goes from kind of like one trauma to the next and, and but there are still moments from what I remember in the novel of, of him being quite funny with himself, uh, kind of reflection on kind of the absurdity of a particular life. Yes, uh, and, yeah, and also remember, I think one of the important things that I also built into the novel, it's also a novel of growth, oh. you know, of, of growth, yes. of growth, of, of, of a young person who goes through certain experiences, and of course those experiences change him, and, 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 and as they change him, he gained a better perspective, and I think that's why, I think the point that you're talking about, when he looks at certain experiences from a certain vantage point, he can actually mock at himself, laugh at himself, despite the, you know, the tragic nature of those experiences, because those experiences change him. And there's also a very strong theme in, in Dinkas' text where, you know, suffering or undergoing that, those tragic moments, they are sort of like for him, in a way, a therapeutic for him, you know, that he, I mean, he's able to gain insight he would not otherwise have had had, had he not gone through those experiences. But I think just to touch on, you know, on real facts is, is that after he had graduated from Rhodes, and remember also, Tepo is also graduated from Rhodes. After he graduated from Rhodes, he also went to, I mean, to, I mean, I mean, to stay in Cape Town. And uh, in a way, he also joined the group of student kids. You know, I mean, whilst he was in Cape Town, yeah, he joined the group of student kids. He had no place to stay, uh, I mean, for quite some time. I mean, even his parents did not know where he was, uh, because he was you know, moving from one part of the city to the other. So in a way, you know, there are you know, parts where you can see there are parallels. Uh, and then, of course, another part that 
you know, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, he was asked about when he was still alive, his sexual orientation, and I think he never came out explicitly about it. But uh, I mean, as you are aware, in both of the novels, you have, I mean, these characters, but in one and one day, we have at least, or at least were involved in sex work. Uh, and also, I mean, from, from his side, he, he has never clarified that. And of course, mm -hmm. I mean, there are different accounts, some people mm -hmm. said, this actually relates to what he, how he lived, and of course there are different, other different accounts. Yeah. There's also, um, I guess, an element of madness. Yes. Oh yes, the question of madness. Even also, I mean, uh, Deka also had those problems as well. Uh, in fact, according to his mother, when I interviewed him, because he said by the time he when he committed suicide, he was, uh, on, um, on, I mean, on, on on a medication, a psychiatric medication. In fact, the mother suspect that it is the effects of that medication that you, I mean, that you got that ultimately caused him to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So there is that element, and of course, as you know, at the beginning of the narrative, it's a poison in psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. but in the, uh, uh, I mean, he stays there, I mean, he counts in detail, uh, you know, his experiences there. So, and also, I mean, he also, I mean, he had the same problem himself. As a, as a writer, I mean, as an individual, I mean, as a individual. With some of the discussions that have been going on um, in the space, I mean, in relation to this talk, um, is the idea, well, you just recently mentioned madness and him taking medication. And those are kind of, well, that's, to me, that's some kind of metaphor of trying, well, in relation to these works, um, where, where one supposedly has a problem, but then tries to fix that problem. So, um, so there are constant, there's, a, there's some kind of protagonism and antagonism involved in some other way. And then, and then just to expand, I think, um, also on on the violences of uh, between Cape Town and Joburg, um, this is also a similar kind of idea where if you have enough of Joburg, you kind of like move to Cape Town for a bit, and if you're tired of Cape Town, you kind of move, you kind of like I mean, like that's how I felt, you know, like you know, moving and showing in between Joburg and Cape Town. Well, like, my, my question is, with that constant, um, that constant clash, or, or with that constant uh, antagonism between Joburg and Cape Town, that, does, that, yes, uh, does that also leave room for trauma for all of the other cities in between Joburg and Cape Town? <laughs> That perhaps sometimes when we think about madness, we tend to think it from a conventional space, but I mean from a conventional perspective. Perhaps madness as well, is it not the fact that somebody refused to conform to the, to the, to the, to the social norms? That any, any or, or at least someone who struggles to, to, to cope with society as it's structured. I mean, like and then that idea. person will be classified as mad. Yeah. That, that you are unable to, to, to to, to adjust yourself to the way the society functions. I mean, like, uh, also the yeah. idea of greatness being at the edge of insanity, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's always, like, a fine little line that yes, you tend to be able to find. Yeah. That if you have to be great, you're going to have to, like, you know, be a little bit crazy or a little bit mad in order to achieve that craziness. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, if you look at, you know, this rehabilitation institutions, and Falkenberg as, as a psychiatric hospital, it functions as that because, when, I mean, as you are admitted into this institution, this institution assumes that you are the problem in the society. Because basically, someone who's mad is somebody who, who has a problem in adjusting to, to, to the way the society functions, or at least the way society has been structured, right? But, but, but as you go into that institution, the institution believes that it's you who has to be fixed, not the society. The society is fine, in fact, you are the one who has to be fixed. 
And that's one of the problems, in fact, uh, Tsepo struggles with as MNS comes in and out. Uh, how many times does it go to the, I mean, I mean, it comes in and out, I think about three times. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, what, what, what makes it to be normal, it's not even the institution, it's, it's also how he, he manages to find himself, not in, in actual fact, even that institution that is meant to fix so-called mad people does not help. So I was just bringing that, that perhaps maybe one way in which we, uh, we need to think about madness is, is perhaps not to look at it from a conventional science. Perhaps maybe we may look at it from the fact that maybe society, maybe it is the society that is abnormal, not, not the individual. Quite frankly, there's no reason to imagine that the white cube space as an institution is any less violent than any other space that we're talking about. Um, the question, uh, there was a question asked uh, last night about what is the what is the safety of these kind of spaces, um, and I don't have a, I don't have an answer. I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts on it, but I don't really know if white cube gallery spaces are are especially safe spaces, um, and. Um, I have one more question for you from, from my side, but um, as I was uh, driving into work along the Star um, uh, Graffiti Wall, um, there's an advert for the Josie Book Fair, which is happening in early September at Bits University, which I think is um, definitely a, a, an endeavor worth supporting. But the, uh, one of the speakers at the Josie Fair is Kimang Wailangulele, um, who is um, a visual artist who works. Um, with the gallery, and so I really like that crossover between literature and visual arts. So that's one version of it. I feel like what we're doing in the conversation that we're having uh, with <coughs> literature and with is a, a similar version. Mm -hmm. um, I think my last question, she might be a little bit of a tough one, so forgive me, but well, while we're standing here in the show, with the show down in Cape Town, um, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm I'm wondering what you feel um, Senator Dacre's uh, final legacy is. You know, there's this novel that's impacted on, on so many people in so many different ways. The idea that he um, somehow spoke about themes that in one way or another are coming out in, in albeit in unexpected ways, but are still um, uh, relevant today. Um, is it unfair to ask what you feel his, his kind of legacy is, given the fact that he was so young when he died? Uh, look, <clears throat> I mean, look, I'm just give my own subjective uh, uh, I mean, response, not, not something that I think is authoritative or anything else. I think what made I mean, the works of Senator Deka is that he sort of like, he does not touch on conventional things. He is, the protagonists, his protagonists are sort of like people who are out of society, you know, people who are uncomfortable in the way the society functions. And unfortunately, some of, perhaps maybe some of those issues that he raised, we can say he was ahead of his time. He, he was ahead of his time because I remember when his first, I mean his, I mean his writings came out, most people in fact were accusing him not being black, a typical black writer. Those were the accusations that actually came out. Right? I, mean, I mean some of them, I mean, not all, but that those were the responses. But, but, but now, you know, today, the, the, the issues that he highlighted then that were seen as unconventional, in fact, are now moving into the center of society. Yeah? They are into the center of the debates now, yeah. It's very interesting, um, in, in my research, in the work with Bessie Mead, that much of the same comes through. Yeah. Um, everything that you're saying is, is, is there are lots of parallels. And, um, I started looking at literature, because uh, we in the visual arts uh, department out there, but if I may turn up to you, also remember this year, also have a problem of, you know, uh, madness. madness as well. Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. Um, and, and, and I started, as an art historian, I started looking at uh, literature because of my frustration with the uh, literature that was being used to look at post colonial art. Um, because if you look at how um, art historians are describing post colonial art, I always feel that there's a lack of specific localized context that, that's been used and I, and I find that in literature. Mm -hmm. I mean a lot of that is out here where you've got a very specific 
um, experience of a, a space which influences the way that people work and the way that people create. And if you don't understand that, you don't have access to the work. Um, so so I, I personally think that the relationship between uh, visual arts and literature is a very productive one that I'm actually very excited about. How do you how do you feel like the South African literature scene would treat the Cyrilo Decker of now, who, twenty years from now, will be ahead of his time, misunderstood, lab mislabeled, and things like that? Look, I think there will be a bigger revolution. Like I said, you know, we are talking about a hypothesis here, a hypothetical question because he's no longer here. But I guess there will be a bigger recognition uh, of, of of what he had done. At least an appreciation of his foresight. And I mean, I mean, that's what I think. Um, and also, that will also depend if maybe perhaps he had also written other books as well. Because remember, an artist is not judged, you know, it's just on the whole uh, of, of, I mean, of his uh, output rather than uh, selected text. Yeah. So that will also depend on those two variables. But perhaps let's say he hadn't written anything else. Let's say he was still alive, he hadn't written anything else. But I, I'm sure definitely there will be a, a better appreciation of his works than uh, I mean, that, that when he was still alive. I might argue, if you don't mind, the exact opposite that the, the day of the describing now would be read in the same way. You would be dismissed as not one thing or another enough and misunderstood and set aside until 20 years later when people most likely rediscover his work. Uh, that seems to be the nature of anyone who's writing in, in, in a kind of uh, as, as a kind of beginning of something or as a kind of early stage of the movement. That, that seems to be the way that I would read such a thing. So, there probably are other writers who, who do occupy that role today. I'm not sure if they are. I wish I, I wish I could throw out a few names. Um, but I imagine that the writers that have been kind of dismissed and set aside now will probably pick up again in 20 years and go, oh, shit, right. I, I, I wouldn't mind the section of the publishing industry in South Africa that it's still quite conservative. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, it, it's still very kind of older male dominance within that space. I don't know if, if I've got the wrong perception, but I, I think uh, if, if you look at what's being published under the big names, it's, it's, it's still, to me, that I, I would agree with you. I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of who's making the decisions on what gets to be published or not. I think you're raising an important point. In fact, in one of the interviews that I remember that they made, I mean, especially when it was about to publish um, um, Values of James, he was sort of asked about whether does he think a black homosexual novel will publish, you know, would he do good in the market? But do, do, there were those questions, you know, that, you know, I mean, uh, um, I mean a novel, a black novel, you know, that, that, that treats these issues male sex worker, who's black, who's gay. You know, do you think is, is this going to work in the market? So there were those questions that I'm about to raise. And, and, and the important thing is that those questions were not raised because of the subjects. They were raised in relation to the blackness. You spoke about madness. I just want to expand on that. Mm -hmm. The idea of suicide. Um, we have Celo Dyke's suicide. We have uh, a number of others. This is Mulelekwa, Tabisusakara. Aswane died in the same year as Keir Siddhartha. And I'm wondering about issues of agency when you decide to take your own life and you know, putting that into conversation with the idea of artistic agency. Well, there's a rich heritage, I think, in artistic practice of destruction. Some of it aimed at the body, a lot of it outward towards objects. And, you know, I think suicide is uh, an idea that invokes mourning and tragedy. But suicide ultimately is also one's own motivation. It's the ultimate form of agency. I'm doing with my body what I wish. You know, I think, but I don't know, I might want to answer a question in relation to Jacob. Yeah, I'm thinking more broadly, but it's such a... 
Yes, because we did Because I think, you know, the idea of one's death, because, I mean, most for, for most human beings, I mean, your death comes unplanned and it's not, it's not an event that you're looking forward to. And perhaps as an artist, as a creator, you think that, let me plan my own exit kind of thing. So, yes, I think you're right that it's something that it can be associated with artistic instinct, that even my end, I'm actually artistically constructing my exit from, you know, from, 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 from this act. But I suppose my, my question really is one that you want to retrieve suicide is not only negative, but if you read that period, there were all these fluorescent minds that were kind of, you know. No, it's fine. Can you go back? I think you mean people like Nathanas and the one who's, I mean, was brought in, which was, which was the same case. It went to a certain extent, even writers like Ken Chamba. Uh, I mean, it may also be great in that way because also, I mean, you know, a diet of alcohol poisoning. That perhaps maybe in my, in my, in my, in my death, that would deliver a video. Or they actually, they, do we tend to actually uh, kind of uh, valorize people who die early, perhaps prematurely sometimes? I mean, with Moses Miller, like with the, I don't know how many albums it was, but right? I kind of probably had one. And, and it's like, I don't know if I'm wondering now if it's actually a great work or that it was just, I didn't have, like there isn't more to actually base my judgment on. So I, I wonder if that's... I just want to touch on, I'm excited about this idea of um, suicide and, and as agency. And perhaps I'm in the wrong gallery to speak about this, but I often read Dear Survivor's oh, yeah. purple figure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think of the, the purple figure or the transforming figure as a sort of suicide, as this um, Sophie is such a problematic um, figure and has been criticized on so many levels that there is no other option, let me kill the wolf. And I should haven't said kill the wolf, but I think this transformation and, and if you look at you know, some of the work around it, so when the figure disappears and it's literally just the, the um, just material, I think it is, I read it as a suicide. I read it as an artist and practicing their agency, saying, okay, I will decide the end of this figure, I, this figure, and if you think about them, Sophie as a autobiographical figure, and when, if Sophie dies, it is almost like a suicide. And, and I, I, would, I would agree with the thing that as an agency, then, and rather than everyone else direct where this um, figure, which is autobiographical, is going to go, I will decide how she dies or what she says transforms. You, you have this broad narrative of the years after 94, which, you know, if we just take the Wikipedia version, it's, it's very optimistic. Yeah. And the entrance into the non-racial democracy. So if you quarantine that from, say, the period of Matt Picasso and Ken Tembo, who were struggling with kind of homelessness fundamentally. Oh yes, yeah, because yeah. politics were part of perhaps what led to their demands. Yeah, so but you have this period where um, one level the optimism of the period, and yet you have such singular figures making such vital statements about where we're living now, and yeah, not always positive, but if you look statistically, there's just all these young men taking their lives. It's very sad, I find, but I mean, I, my question was partly just to not, I suppose, linger on the sadness, but yeah. to try to see also perhaps some positivity. Or perhaps logic in the madness. Sure, so that's just a good way of putting it. Okay. And, uh, 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 between the 
objects you have here and this life in this book. How are we meant to kind of look at the objects in relationship to? Are you directing? I mean, you're the curator, so I know it's not your project. <laughs> I think is to look at this text, for example, that were produced about 10 years ago. How, for example, I mean, because most of these, I mean, uh, I mean, exhibitions are are, are, are are contemporary productions. How those themes from the from the books that were published a uh, few, I mean, 10 years ago, they still render the resonate. For example, I was looking at uh, here, I mean, about incarceration, you know, which is related to. To, I mean, to Falkenberg, I mean, the story where he talks about the confined space where, as an individual, you are under these rules, you are expected to behave in this way. And there, of course, there are these expected outcomes out of, by the institution that they expect out of you as you enter the institution, and how, as an individual, you experience the institution in contradistinction to what is expected, or at least the expected outcomes of the institution as well. I mean, that, that becomes an interesting part of it. Um, I would like to kind of just, if there is like one last comment or question, just so that we can wrap it up. And thank you, Tavo, for um, coming through and actually just having this interesting conversation. Um, it was really great. Thank you for coming and um, having such a nice, very good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.